Welcome back, my fellow volunteer freedom fighters and lovers of freedom, my returning subscribers and those who are watching from a distance. Hello, and God bless every one of you. But if you can do me a favor, go ahead and smack the red button and click the notification bell so whenever we upload, you'll be able to get notified. On this video, you are going to see the cry for Nigeria because Nigeria is on a dangerous, disastrous collapse. Now they can't warn Nigeria. But they took him for granted and called him a miscreant. Today, that miscreant word is coming to pass in Nigeria because people don't understand the power of God and the power of a prophet in the land. Fulani is a very arrogant and very stubborn people and they have brought an end to Nigeria. I want you to listen to United States. Uh, and again, have to say. the purpose of this event is to try to make sure that the Congress of the United States, um, the administration of this country, our friends and allies around the world, and not least, of course, people of goodwill in this country and elsewhere, are on notice that Nigeria is at risk of disastrous collapse. That the forces that we've just been talking about are in the process of taking down a country that is the most populous in Africa with horrific implications, not just for the immediate vicinity, the Lake Chad region as it's known, but for that continent and almost certainly others beyond. Uh, Congressman Wolf mentioned Bono, talking about a catastrophe that would make what has happened to it, Europe in the past few years as a relatively small number of people migrated there with unbelievably chaotic consequences look like a day at the beach by comparison. But we're on notice and the question is do we have to wait until this horror is upon us before something is done about it? Or do we take steps now to try to prevent that? And I don't think any of us is saying that this is a panacea. But the appointment of the appropriate individual with the requisite authority, and I just wanted to underscore what Congressman Wolf said about having the President of the United States essentially personally empowering Senator Danforth to lead the effort on behalf of our country to alleviate that situation. That has to be done again and it has to be an empowering of a person with the stature and the capabilities needed to do two really vital things. One is to pull together the government agencies that have responsibility for pieces of a problem like Nigeria. The Defense Department, as well as, of course, the State Department, USAID, the UN mission of the United States, the National Security Council, and others, to come together with a common, appropriate, and much needed policy approach. And then secondly, at least as importantly, to be able authoritatively to represent what that approach is to the government of Nigeria. So they know who they're dealing with. They know that this is in fact the policy and they can't go, you know, looking for people who will provide some sort of uh, alternative that might not require as much of them. So it's those two vitally important things that have to be done. And on behalf of, uh, again, the Save the Persecuted Christians coalition and team, I just want to say I think this is a moment of truth, a moment when we will find a difference being made by an administration that is about making a difference on behalf of religious freedom. 
those who are being denied it around the world. And let me just take a moment to say, as bad as this situation is, it is just one of the areas in the world in which particularly Christians are suffering. By some estimates, it's as small a number as 215 million Christians being brutally persecuted. By others, it's as high as half a million. Excuse me, half a billion. This is on our watch. It is unconscionable. It must be challenged, contested, and if possible, stopped. And that's what this coalition is about. And I pray that we will be able, with the help of people like Congressman Estes and Congressman Wolf and the Archbishop and our coalition and countless others, to see this problem sorted by the appointment at the earliest possible moment, preferably by the end of this year, because these elections are approaching, of an individual with the requisite authority of the President of the United States and the assignment of making both the U.S. government policy coherent and clear and effective and communicating that, again, authoritatively to the uh, government of Nigeria, who in the end is ultimately responsible for preventing this catastrophe. Especially those in Nigeria. It seems, as this book points out, this is being driven mostly by the Igbo intelligentsia in diaspora, the new resurgence. The new ones within, there seems to be a division, three classes you can identify. The ones within the mainland, and I'm shocked, and you discuss, they have a different point of view. Those in diaspora within Nigeria, so to speak, who are in Abuja and Lagos and so on and so forth, Kano, Kaduna, and so on. And an elder was asked about that, living in one of these uh, northern states about Biafra, and they asked him, uh, what do you think about this Biafra? He said, well, no. Nah. I just said, no, I can my name on a mama and I want to know. Not to go my way. In other words, they should keep it up, but you know I can no longer go now. You see, all the things I have here, I cannot carry them on my head. So, there seems to be a sense of either denial and on one part, or people who think, no, 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 it won't be. Because we can't just imagine it. And because of some discussion that, oh, okay, if this happens, uh, you will lose your property, you will lose that, and so on. Of course, that is untenable. I mean, uh, I, I too was wrong on this because if, uh, if by any chance you have another state of Biafra, it will be the 16th state of ECOWAS. And that means you have free movement of goods and persons. But the fundamental question, the fundamental issue is that this debate is not happening. This whole thing is being driven almost in a haphazard manner. Last week, they called for, was that last week? Yeah, last week. They called for a seat, seat at home. And even without anybody getting out to more in force and so on, I learned virtually Anambra and many other cities were completely shut down. It just tells you there is something going on. But... Again, where is the elite in this? What is missing is structural debate and the apparent elite aloofness or complicity or hypocrisy. The elite in denial. For the politicians who think you can just, let's use them temporarily, you know. Let's use them. Just go on. Why we can then use that to negotiate for something here. I can tell you... <laughs> You will create a monster that will consume you. <laughs> when that fame inferno comes, both us, everybody else, and the kind of thing that happened in Biafra where decent, any decent was considered a saboteur. Okay? You might get to a point where you will be telling them, just go on, while we can negotiate here, get something for ourselves in Abuja. 
I can tell you these guys are no fools. At some point, they will look at you too and know that you're actually part of the problem. <laughs> and so on and so forth. So, I say, let the debate, the debate must begin. The late Dr. Pius Okibo, in this book as well, presented what the memo by elect Dr. Pius Okibo presented to the Biafran government on the economic viability of Biafra. Nobody is talking about what the, new, what the currency will look like. How will you fare with international trade? What kind of constitution are you talking about? And Afadile forcefully argues here that the Ahera Declaration of 1969 came too late. They, they had intelligentsia pushing for Biafra, but there was no organized structure that if they had done what they did towards the end of the war, at the beginning, a, a Biafra would not have been ended the way that it did. But what is shocking is people talk about this in their bedrooms and in their palace, and then you come out and everybody is just, mm, and so on. I'm sure it will not take long. So what I am calling is that we must, the elite, the intelligentsia, get out of the closet and let us, now that the issue, the president in New York made a point. He said there will be no referendum in Biafra. Now, and I said, my reaction to it was, oh my God. So this matter has actually gotten to the point where we are now talking whether to have a referendum or not to have a referendum. The moment you be, you've reached that point, it tells you that it's only a matter of uh, time. But who is driving the debate? The neo-Zikism, neo-Biafranism, and so on and so forth, everybody seems to be quite quiet. And finally, let me agree with Walesho Inka that Biafra is an idea. And that is what this book talks about. You can't defeat it with guns or prison cells. The only way to defeat it is to offer a counter-narrative. What should? There has been none, no counter-narrative until now. What Honorable Afodile has done is to provide very powerful, not only counter-narrative, but counter-narratives. And I will say, and stresses the urgency of action now. The clock is ticking. And I can only end by congratulating Chode for this eminent work. Thank you very much. If you are amazing people, if the video interests you, go ahead, like, share.